Good morning everybody, it's Graham again from Unearthed and it is the next episode of Detecting Talk. Uh, how quickly these films come around. It's uh, amazing how these weeks fly by. Now this is going to be an interesting topic for a lot of you detectorists out there that watch this channel and may have the same thoughts uh, and ideas uh, as I do. And this is regarding um, detecting in general. So when I first started detecting years and years ago, uh, what, what amazed me right from the start was, or what I was captivated with, is the age of the items that we were finding. So all of a sudden I was transported into this world of imagination, history, everything collided together and fitted together smack bang like a, like a glove. Now you may think it's daft, but I always remember the first coin first old coin I found, which was, a, I found plenty of copper coins, Victorian and Edwardian, which was great. But the first old coin I found was an, an Elizabethan sixpence dated 1596. And that was the oldest coin, uh, an item that I had found up, in, up, up until that, that date. And because it had the date on it, so it actually told you what the date was, it immediately transported me back to the Elizabethan times. And all of a sudden, I went from being really bad at history. I mean, I, my, my exam results and my reports from school, uh, I always remember one of the teachers giving me a D9, which is nearly the lowest you could ever get. What, you know, and, and the comment on the, on the slip was, why he attends the history lessons, you know, is anyone's business because he may, not, he's, he may as well not be here. It's a waste of time. Because I just didn't have any interest in history. The way they taught history at school was, was boring. But of course, detecting comes along and all of a sudden a light bulb goes on and you immediately become interested in history. So that particular coin I found made me do loads and loads of research on the Elizabethan period. Queen Elizabeth herself, her life, her times, what the Elizabethan and the Tudor people got up to, how they lived, how they died, how they ate, how they slept, everything. Absolutely amazed by that period of history. And of course, uh, you, you're automatically transported into, uh, into a different world because you want to know who actually dropped the coin. Who was that person that had all of that sixpence? Was he depressed and saddened that he'd lost it? How quickly did he realise that he'd lost the coin? You know, did he search frantically for it um, on the trackway back to the church where he may have thought he'd lost it, um, which is where he did lose it, to be fair, because that's where I found it. And it'd been there for all that time. It hadn't moved. It was on pasture. So the imagination starts moving and the interest of the historical items that we find starts moving. And that has remained with me ever since, right to this current present time, I'm still amazed, you know, it's just outstanding. Uh, it astounds me to think, you know, who held these items before we got our, our hands on them. And of course, the coins and artifacts we find, we're only, we're only temporary custodians of them. It'll, you know, when we pass away, the, the items and artifacts and coins will get passed on to somebody else and the process will start again. And hopefully they'll have the same imagine, imagination and the thoughts uh, about these items that we find but it does get you to a point where you start thinking how come there were so many coins and artifacts lost over the years and it's that is the that is the topic of this film and before just before I start I forgot something can you see that folks I'm <laughs> I'm getting messages of people watching this channel saying that I look like him. Now I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but apparently I look like Messi. Now I won't mind being a pound behind him in monetary value, that'd be alright wouldn't it? I could play football, half a, a quarter of as good as him, but I don't think I look like Messi. So use little mickey takers out there that's saying that I look like him, thanks very much for the messages. Um, I did have a wry smile. So there you are, folks, you can make up your mind. Do I look like him? Only you could answer. 
Right, back to the theme. I, rem I, I was supposed to do that at the start, but I forgot. Because my imagination starts kicking in about other things. So, how come there were so many coins and artifacts lost? Now, we have touched on these similar subjects over the past detecting talk way back. But I think it's right to explore for you guys that are new to the channel. And news detectorists that probably have the same thoughts as I do. What you've got to think of is this. And I've done a lot of research on finds over the years. Too, probably too much research. And it hasn't sunk. All of it hasn't sunk in. Maybe 10% sunk in. The other 90% has gone out there and disappeared. But what sticks with me is this. Going back four or five hundred years or more, in, before the Industrial Revolution kicked in, where were the people? The people like me and you, where were, we, where were they at? Now if we were lucky enough and we were born into wealth, we would have been surrounded by buildings, manor houses, peel towers possibly, if we were lucky, castles, if we were extremely lucky. But if it was just in modern day, person like me and you back then, we would have been peasants, serfs, working the land, farmers, tending the crops. So the majority of the time that they spent would have been out in the fields, the fields that we detect on. So you've got to ask yourself, what you've got to ask yourself is this, who had the money? Now you'd be surprised with the answer. Who had the money? Who lost the money? Who had the money in the fields? Who lost the money in the fields? And it was, surprisingly, the peasants. It wasn't the nobleman? wasn't the merchants, wasn't the rich landowners, it was the peasants that lost the coins. So the coins that we find, the pennies, the half pennies, the farthings, the hammers, were all lost predominantly by the peasants because they were the ones that had the coins. They were the ones that got paid a penny a day for the work in the fields. And when they're out in the fields, they won't want their coins and belongings back at home where it could be stolen. So they kept it on them. They kept it on them in the fields. I've done some really interesting research on this and if I get chance, it's an old document and it's a bit, bit of a long-winded document in so much as it covers a lot of topics, but it's wrote by a professor uh, and I could probably print it out and if people wanted a copy of it and they were interested in how the peasants, you know, the peasants lived and died in them days, it actually covers the topic of the coinage. They had the coins. So they were paid by the landowners, by the rich noblemen or wherever, the merchants and everybody else that milled around with the money. And the peasants were the ones that had the pennies, the hammered pennies, the farthings and the half cuts and the half pennies. And they were the ones that were working the land, you know, pretty much. I mean, they had rest periods, so I don't think they were flogged to death in the fields for 12 hours a day every day, because obviously winter uh, and in the springtime, they would have been doing other chores. But they were out in them fields pretty much uh, all the time in so much as working the land, making sure the crops were tended to, firewood, hunting, fishing, you may, name it. They were doing all sorts of weird and wonderful pastimes, chores and work related um, subjects. So they were the ones that have the coins and artifacts. They're the ones that we're, fi we're finding peasant material. The little strap ends, the plain little strap ends, the buckles, coinage. Everything else, it was them that held it. So when you think you're on a field that's producing quite a few, we'll use Lincolnshire for an example, there's a lot of half pennies. There's a lot of pennies, a lot of cut farthings in the Lincolnshire county. If you're lucky enough, you might stumble across a half groat or a groat. If you're really lucky enough, you might stumble across a quarter noble. But the peasants wouldn't have had the quarter nobles. Probably the peasants wouldn't have even had the groats. Half groats, possibly. But remember, they got paid a penny a day for their, for their work in a lot of cases. So it was the peasants in these counties, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Suffolk and others, Yorkshire and so on, that were working the land and losing the stuff. So they had, you know, they, they had it out with the belongings with them out in the field and that's why there's so many bits and pieces lost in the land, in the fields, because it's these guys that were doing the jobs that were losing it. So that's one thing to consider. But you also got to consider, why else was there so many stuff lost? I mean, we can go into some fields that obviously were extensively farmed over the centuries and find, you know, we can on a good day, we can find five, six, seven hammered coins a day, plus artifacts. If you look, you might get a lead seal and a couple of nice buckles with the pins remaining and a bit of a strap in. If you're really lucky, you might find a bit of a bronze ring or a silver ring. Um, and you've got to ask yourself, why was there so many things lost? Well, it had to end up somewhere, didn't it? If it wasn't melted down, the silver and gold, right? Before the cities, 
the huge cities and the motorways and all the tracks and the tarmac and all the concrete and everything else it had to end up somewhere a lot of it's in them fields buried lost until we come along and find it without the detectors so it's a very interesting subject and you've got to think how and why these things were lost because it absolutely captivates me I, from day one I was thinking why are these things lost and of course some things were lost intentionally some people buried them for safekeeping because they didn't have the banks to go to they didn't have a bank book and say right I want to put 80 hammered pennies in a vault or in a bank you know there's your 80 pennies thanks very much there's your book they didn't have, that. They didn't have them facilities in them days so if you had 80 pennies and you were worried about them getting stolen where would you put them? Well, you put them in the ground. You put them somewhere, a land, a, a, land, a landmark next to that oak tree, in line with that oak tree, 20 yards out, 15 yards out, 10 yards out. Get it down there, just deep enough so you can retrieve it quickly, but deep enough to keep it out of the way. Oh, I thought there was somebody behind me then. Because the gate's banging out there. Whew. Could have been an ancient spirit. Um, so that's what you need to think about is how come there were so many things lost and why it was lost so hoards purse losses places that were in trouble so for example up here in the north where we are in cumbria we've got a big abbey a mile away from here where i'm pointing furnace abbey second biggest abbey of the country second richest abbey in the country can't find hammered coins around it for love of money because you can't get near it. The fields surrounding it are all pasture and heavily wooded and out of bounds and anything else, which you can understand. But even the farmland further out, you get, you get the odd penny, hammered penny here and there, which is okay. If you're lucky, you might get a shilling, a uh, Charles shilling or Elizabethan shilling if you're a bit uh, if you're a bit further out, if you're lucky. But medieval finds from that abbey are pretty much sparse because you just can't get near it you know, in, that, in that radius. You can't detect. It's all built upon or it's... The hospitals took a lot of land or it's all heavily wooded and leaf mould and everything's dropped out of the way and you can't get permission off the farmers anyway. But going back then, 800 years ago, that abbey was under threat because Robert the Bruce's men from Scotland came down and raided this area, torched Dalton, sacked the abbey, even though they were paid off not to do it. They still did it. Now, if you were relatively not well off but if you were you know you had 10 20 pennies on you saved up for whatever reason you hoarded away your pennies because it would have been hoarders in them days people that saved the money and squirreled it away like there is today um what would you have done you'd have buried it for safekeeping so you'd have buried it in that wood on that banking that line of trees that was there then probably gone now but in them days there was a line of trees there and they buried it in the banking because they didn't want robert the bruce's men to come along and take them, raid it, raid, your, raid, raid your, your peasant's house and torch it, so you hid it, but you never went back to retrieve it after they'd been because they killed you. So that's how you've got to think, you've got to think, you know, up here in the north there is hordes, there is hordes because of these reasons. And of course there's hordes because people stole, you know, there's just as many, probably just as many thieves back then there is, as there is now. And why? Did you, you know, these thieves would have maybe maybe took the church's takings for the, for the week, got all the medieval silver pennies and squirreled them away somewhere, only to be caught doing it and hung, never went back to retrieve it. And of course, some of the hordes were buried at dusk when they think they can line things up. Yeah, in line with them trees. Yeah, I'm going to put it here just as it's getting dark. But next morning or a couple of mornings later, you go back and you think, now then, where was it? And you start digging around frantically, you can't find it because it was too too dark for you to line it up properly. And you, you're maybe 10 yards out. And that 10 yards is all the difference it takes for finding it and not finding it. And that hard stayed. You could have gone back multiple times to find out where you put it. The clever people might have put a marker, they might have put a stake there or a stick or a bit of a twig. But if you did it in haste and you did it quickly, just as it was getting dark, What's your chances of refinding it a few days, few weeks, few months later? Minimal. But of course, there's other areas in the country where there was times of peace and prosperity, so they maybe didn't hoard as much then because of the threat of raids and things. And probably the only hoard you find around these villages and cities now have probably been 
merchants coming into the city to do trade, a city that they don't know or a town that they don't know very well, they're a bit apprehensive. They've got 20, 20 hammered in the pocket, including a quarter noble, a few groats, a few half groats and pennies. Mm. They'll go in there, they'll go in one of the inns, they'll get pickpocketed, they'll get beat up, they'll get robbed. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm just going to bury it on the outskirts of this town, on the main track in. Just to the left, I'm going to stick it there for safekeeping. Puts it there, doesn't know the area very well, he's only been here two or three times for trade and business, but he takes that gamble, buries it. Goes to the town, books in at the local inn, gets into argument that night, gets bumped off, doesn't go back and retrieve the, the hoard. Or he gets away quite lightly, does his trade, does his business, comes back along the track, can't find it. Where was it? Doesn't know the area very well, there's people milling around on horseback and walking, doesn't want to be seen as being, you know, up to something, lost. Or he might got ill, or he might, you know, you just don't know why these people didn't come back and retrieve these hoards. So it's very, very interesting. It's a very interesting subject. And again, you've also got to think of, in them days, going back, we're talking about the medieval period, but the Roman period and other periods, Saxon and everything else, people had, people would have had poor eyesight. So they'd have had poor eyesight from birth. They didn't have the luxury of going to spec savers, getting the glasses to sort the eyesight out, long, long sightedness, short sightedness, whatever. People would have been born, at, at, well, would it have been a high percentage? A decent percentage of people would have been born with poor eyesight or developed poor eyesight over the years, in, in so much as if they had coins and artifacts on them working out in the fields and the grass was getting a bit long or the crops were in or whatever and they lost a couple of pence, what's the chances of them with their poor eyesight scrambling around on the floor to find them again? They're lost. In that long grass, they're lost. So you've got to think of these factors um, and there's a whole host of other reasons why people lost things over the years and we as detectorists come along centuries later and find them which is fantastic because they would have been lost forever we're giving that coin and artifact its chance to be seen again not just by archaeologists and these elite people out there it's us detectorists that are having a, a slice of the of the luxury of finding these things and looking after them recording them and keeping them for safekeeping and prosperity or whatever so have a think about why things were lost over the years and give me some of your opinions because what I've just covered there is probably only a small percentage. You guys have probably got some fantastic ideas that I'll be thinking, oh yeah, you're right. You're dead right. Why haven't I thought of that? There must be a whole host. And of course, we're talking about votive offerings as well. People threw things away as votive offerings. The Celts did it on low-lying areas in the watery, uh, watery places. I think the Bronze Age people would have done the same. Dry, dries up over the centuries, we come along with our detectors on the low lying ground, start picking them out. There's that sort of thing as well that goes on. But, um, but you know, people say, why is there so many things lost in fields? Of course, you've got the market sites that went on in the middle of fields as well. You know, there could be, in them days, it could have been quite a prominent site. Lovely flat field, just on the outskirts of the church and the village, <coughs> where they had a market. <coughs> and they may have even had fairs on there. Centuries later, that field just becomes a nondescript field and mixed in with the other farmland in the surrounding area. The hedges might have come out and it just looks like a normal field built into three or four. But you're finding 20 or 30 hammered. A season in it. Why? Why is there so many hammered? Eventually the cogs will start working. You think there's got to be a, been a market on here. There's been trade going on. <clears throat> you start finding other things. Weights, trade weights and things. Coin weights, they start coming up. In amongst the medieval pennies and half pennies so you've got to think you know you've got to start i think as a detectorist if, if you've got an imagination linked to detecting that makes it all more sweeter <clears throat> rather than just picking these coins up out of the ground with your detector and selling them on ebay you know what's the point some people do it that's, that's up to them <clears throat> but the real detectorists out there i think are the ones that use their imagination i love the collections love finding the stuff like i do and uh, it just makes it more worthwhile doing it when you think, who had hold of that key? Who had hold of that ring? How did they lose it? Who were they? Was it a man or was it a woman? It's just amazing to think that you transport. It's the nearest thing you're going to get to time travel. The nearest thing you're going to get to time travel is detecting. Because you're unearthing things that haven't been touched by human hands as best part of 2,000 years in some places or more. Truly, truly amazing. So give me your thoughts on losses over the years. You may come up with some fantastic ideas that I've never even thought of. Before we go, as well, putting that to bed, 
the imagination part gone. Magic coils, we're getting asked about them all the time. I wish I never did them earlier videos last month on them because I expected them to be here by now, folks, so they're not. And it's because our friends at the UK Customs in Coventry, HM, HMRC Customs or whoever they are, are holding them. They've had them since the 17th of March. What are they doing with them? What are they doing with them? It makes me wonder how so many drugs get into this country and so many illegal people get into this country, yet I'm trying to get a batch of coils from Europe. I can't get them because it goes into customs and they hold them for 10 days. Ridiculous. Get your finger out customs if you're watching this. So I can't do any more. I can't even contact them. There's not even a number. Well, there is a number. You ring it, it knocks you off. It's just so frustrating. So they're there. They're ready to come to me. They've been here for days and days and days, week, over a week. I still can't get my hands on them because any idiots at the customs are checking them for everything. What are they checking them for? They're probably having a fag out the back and a cup of tea. While my box of coils is like, now nah, we'll, we'll check that tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, they still do the same. Low hanging fruit, they're checking the small packages, but they can't be bothered checking my box of coils. I'd love to, do you know what? I'd love to go down there and talk to them direct. I wouldn't half give them a blast. And of course, their argument's going to be, oh, we have thousands of parcels coming in. It's just a bunch of metal detecting coils, for God's sake. Put your sniffer dog round them. Check a couple of samples if you, if you need to. Check the paperwork out. Check me out as a business and release them. So, fr frustrating about them. It, they're here, so I don't know when. So, sorry, sorry. Look, when they're, when they're here, I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you know about it. But I'm just getting so peed off in waiting for these coils to come, come in. Because they're fantastic coils. I can't wait to get my hands on one or two of them myself to use. Um, Organised digs coming up, folks. Not this weekend. Mother's Day and everything else is going on, so that's cancelled. My detecting's finished. Whew. The crops have gone in. The land's no go now, so I'm back. I'm not travelling now till June, July. So you'll see no more videos of me out in the field, apart from if I did start detecting up here in Cumbria, which I'm going to start doing. I'm going to start using the Equinox 800. So the G2 Plus, as good as it is, I love that machine. It is my favourite machine of all time. I'll never part with it. It's just the best on arable, iron infested, medieval sites, Roman sites. That's going to stay with me until I'm going to keep that safe and warm until July comes and I'll get it back out. But while I'm up here in the north, the Equinox 800 is coming out. And the reason why is because people are doing so well with it up here in the north. They're getting some unbelievable finds at depth of the Equinox 800. So right, I'm going to join them. I'm going to try it. See what the hype's about. So what's his space? Next organised dig, two weeks. Not this weekend, weekend after. New land, new farm. News on Earth customers out there. You've probably already got an invite off the, off the group. Happy days. Watch this space. More videos coming soon on that. And give me some feedback on this film, if you can. Thanks for watching, everybody. And I'll catch up with you soon. Bye for now.